So welcome everybody um, and thank you for joining our webinar, A Light for Every Birth. Um, today we will be hearing um, from our uh, partners, uh, We Care Solar, who are the makers and uh, sort of the innovators behind the solar suitcases. Uh, and then our colleague Richard Libruck will be talking a little bit more about the project that we have in Mozambique uh, with Ahali uh, and how those uh, solar suitcases are being implemented in health centers uh, in Mozambique. Um, so we will have some time for a short Q&A in between the two speakers and again at the end. Um, and uh, we would invite you to though, if you have questions along the way to please type them into the chat box. Uh, and Suzanne Ramsey will be kind of monitoring and facilitating questions and answers uh, during the webinar. Thanks, Kim, and welcome everyone. It's good to see all of you. Um, a special welcome to Kim Gordon. Uh, Kim is the Senior Manager of Global Programs and has been with We Care Solar since 2015. She holds a bachelor's degree in international affairs and a master's degree in global finance and economic integration. For the past 15 years, she has worked with Village Enterprise, Kiva, Vitana, and many other nonprofits to improve the quality of life in rural communities in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Kim loves to travel and has lived, worked, and, and traveled to over 50 countries. Also want to uh, say a, a word of welcome to Feza Kabasweka Green. Feza is Senior Program Manager in Uganda for We Care Solar. Prior to joining We Care Solar, she worked with Innovations for Poverty Action, the International Growth Center, Advocates Coalition for Development and Environment, the Grameen Foundation, DFID in the UK, and the Economic Policy Research Center. Faisa holds a master's degree in African and International Development and a BA in Economics. She's passionate about development innovations and programs that bring about sustainable change in Africa, like We Care Solar Suitcase. And Faisa is joining us from Kampala in Uganda. Welcome to both of you. Um, and I'd like to ask Richard if he would introduce our partner, uh, Olinda, who is in Mozambique. Richard? Thank you very much, Suzanne. Yes, it's a pleasure to introduce Olinda Sebastian Magaya. She's the executive director of EHALI, our, our longtime partner in Mozambique for, for quite a long time. I've had the pleasure of knowing uh, Olinda for more than 20 years. I think we've broken the Guinness Book of Records uh, for the amount of consecutive years I've been involved with their projects. Um, she is highly qualified nurse. Uh, she's a, a trainer of trainers uh, in maternal and child health. Uh, HIV AIDS, and I would imagine now COVID-19. So uh, please welcome Melinda. She will be back with us uh, probably in September when we have more time to really give us uh, the big picture of the solar suitcases. Uh, but she's here with us now to correct me when I make errors. Thanks, Richard. And um, I think we'll pass it over to Kim now to um, give us the word about we Care Solar and A Light for Every Birth. Um, thanks everyone for having me here today. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you about a little bit about the history of We Care Solar, how the solar suitcase got um, was developed and talk through a little bit of our program model and the different sorts of things we're involved in. So um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm gonna share my screen and I have a little presentation prepared. So uh, We Care Solar, our, our mission is to promote safe motherhood and reduce maternal mortality in developing regions by providing health workers with reliable lighting and electricity for mobile communication and medical devices using solar electricity. Co-founder and CEO, Dr. Laura Stachel traveled to Northern Nigeria back in 2008 to study ways to lower maternal mortality in hospitals. She spent most of her time in this labor and delivery room that you see here. And in two weeks, she saw patients arriving with more pregnancy complications than she had seen in her entire career as an OBGYN. 
Yet the hospital lacked basic equipment and moreover did not have electricity for 12 hours a day. Without a reliable source of electricity, she saw nighttime deliveries being attended in near darkness. Cesarean sections were canceled or conducted by flashlight and critically ill patients waited hours or days for life-saving procedures and the outcomes she saw were tragic. She shared stories about conditions in the hospital with her husband, Hal. Hal was, a, Hal was at the time teaching educators and youth in California about solar energy and hearing her stories, Hal was equally drawn to this problem. Hal's idea was to design several standalone solar electric systems targeting the areas of the hospital most critical for maternal and newborn survival. This included the operating room, the maternity ward, uh, labor and delivery, the lab, and the lab for an autonomous blood bank refrigerator. Laura wanted to show her Nigerian colleagues what she and Hal thought of and asked them to design a small demonstration kit for her to bring back to the hospital. She asked them to make it small enough so that it would um, fit in her suitcase to avoid any difficulties going through customs. When she returned to Nigeria toting this demonstration kit, they immediately put it to use. It didn't take long for other local clinics to hear what happened at the state hospital. They began asking for solar as well. They said, we do deliveries at night. Why is it only the hospital gets this solar power? So Lauren Howe realized that they needed a solar solution that could scale. And together they founded We Care Solar to improve health outcomes for mothers and babies in regions without reliable electricity. And here pictured is the very first demo kit that was ever designed. Um, in 2010, Hal and Laura had the good fortune to attend a virtual um, conference for the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, where Brent Mullenberg, who's now Weaker Solar's Director of Engineering, he was at the time a volunteer with Engineers Without Borders, spoke about challenges of providing reliable and renewable electricity in low resource settings. As We Care Solar was still in its infancy, Hal and Laura were experiencing these same challenges that he was talking about. So they contacted Brent to share his experiences and ideas. He ended up spending the next couple of years volunteering for We Care Solar. And as he became more familiar with the kits that Hal had built, he could see that despite the functionality of the kits, a manufacturer's design was necessary in order to provide the scale needed to meet growing demand. So in 2011, Brent began working on the design, which solidified shortly thereafter as the We Care Solar suitcase. So on the left here is um, a photo of manufacturing happening for the very first solar suitcase deployment. This was in 2012. There was 20 solar suitcases going to Liberia. And this was um, the manufacturing um, happening in Brent's attic, the very first one. On the right, this is Brent with an early prototype of our version three solar suitcase, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit. So over time, we were eager to improve the design and interface to respond to the growing demand and expand our impact. So the current version of the solar suitcase, which is what we call version three, is a result of years of field testing, design modifications, and technology improvements. In reality, there weren't just three versions of the suitcase, but rather it was an iterative process constantly changing and improving based on feedback from both installers and end users. We began working on version three in 2015, and it took us about four years to design, test, and finalize it. So this is version three. This is where we are today. Um, the We Care Solar suitcase, it's a robust, easy to use solar electric system that's specifically designed to provide last mile health facilities with highly efficient medical lighting, and power for mobile communication and small medical devices. The water and dust tight yellow case becomes a cabinet that mounts to the wall and the solar panels are secured to the roof. The system includes a 12 volt, 20 amp hour lithium ferrous phosphate battery, four high efficiency LED lights for medical task lighting, two 12 volt accessory sockets or lighter sockets. Um, they're like the ones that you see in cars, two USB ports, and uh, two expansion ports to allow for optional accessories or additional lights. A custom display and user interface, which is a new thing that came about with version three, makes operations simple and intuitive for the health workers. The solar suitcase also includes two rechargeable headlamps, a fetal Doppler with rechargeable batteries, uh, an infrared thermometer, which we just added um, last year in response to COVID, and a rechargeable battery charger. 
And um, I'm going to show you a demo of this suitcase at the end of this presentation of the actual suitcase. So what makes our solar suitcase unique? Well, there's a few things that makes it unique. One is that we're filling a very specific niche gap, and that's reliable electricity, specifically for maternal and child health. Our human-centered design uh, was, our design is based on lots of user testing. We did user testing in Ghana and Uganda as we were developing um, version three. And it really focuses on ease of installation and use to prevent user abuse and um, any sort of um, ma making sure everybody knows how to use it so that it doesn't, so that it expands the longevity of the suitcase. The system is integrated all in one, all in one unit. So the lighting appliances and power production components are delivered as one unit and it's easy to install and less prone to um, problems. The sealed LFP batteries can safely be stored inside the health facilities and the low voltage DC system avoids shock hazard includes overcurrent protection, making sure it's safe. Our lights are also designed to last 70,000 hours and specifically have a color rendering capacity suitable for medical use. There's no fuses to replace, no battery, regular battery maintenance required. Battery replacements estimated to occur just once every five years. And our systems are intentionally small, so they can be installed quickly and affordably. We, we carefully match the loads, the battery, the solar generation, so the system is reliable and has a much longer life. No inverters means that the systems are inherently more energy efficient and more reliable. So design and manufacturing of our solar suitcase is just one component of a holistic model that we use to support mothers and babies globally. We build local capacity and in solar suitcase installation, use and maintenance with in-depth training for installers and government technicians to create effective and sustainable programs. Our trained teams conduct installations to the highest quality standards and we build quality control mechanisms into all of our programs. On-site training of health workers is a necessary and important component of our program model. We also implement through local partners like um, Ihale. Our local implementing partners are the backbone of our programs. So our, our diverse range of health, solar, and research partners support and strengthen our impact. Government support is also integral to the success of our programs. Often governments will help identify and prioritize recipient health facilities, ease logistical challenges, and provide long-term support to ensure successful and sustainable programs. Sustainability is really paramount to the success of our mission. So um, our technical design, programmatic approach, and allocation of resources ensure that solar suitcases provide at least a decade of reliable lighting and electricity. We also conduct rigorous qualitative and quantitative research and document how basic lighting and electricity are feasible and affordable for all remote health facilities. And we actively engage with partners and global leaders to advocate for clean energy for safe childbirth. We identify champions and invite them to join our advocacy efforts at a national and international scale through our Light Every Birth Initiative, which I'll talk about um, in a little while. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about impact. So, um, you know, you're wondering, well, why, why lighting? They need, to, these health facilities need so many other things. What, why lighting? Well, next time you're going in for a major surgery, why don't you ask your doctor to turn off the light and see, see how you feel about going through that um, in the dark. So what are these people facing? They're, they're, health workers are using unreliable and dangerous sources of light, often kerosene or candles, which can expose, um, which can cause burns and also uh, dangerous breathing, dangerous air for breathing. Health workers will postpone diagnosis and critical treatment like suturing a hemorrhage until morning, or they'll even send patients away because they're afraid to do it in the dark. And working in the dark demoralizes both the health workers and the patients and, and increases risks of contamination. With reliable electricity, um, we have found through multi-country quantitative and qualitative evaluations that with our solar suitcases, health workers feel empowered. They have improved capacity to manage deliveries. Obstetric emergencies are more quickly and appropriately managed. Health workers are able to make more appropriate referrals. Pregnant women have a greater incentive to deliver at the health facility with a skilled health professional. And the solar suitcases, part of a larger set of inventions, can contribute to a larger set of interventions 
can contribute to reductions in maternal and newborn mortality. In addition to 10 years of qualitative data, um, which we're preparing for publication actually, um, we have quantitative evaluations by AMREF in Uganda, Pathfinder International in Nigeria, and Pathfinder in Tanzania. And these st studies have demonstrated a marked decrease in maternal and newborn mortality in programs where solar suitcases were part of a comprehensive approach to, emergency, to improving emergency obstetric care. In a study in 100 facilities in Southwest Uganda, for example, there was an 80% increase in facility-based deliveries. To date, We Care Solar has reached more than 6,200 health centers in over 40 countries. Every installation includes, includes an interactive training for midwives and other health workers. More than 26,000 health workers have learned to use our technology, and we estimate more than 7.5 million mothers and babies have been served in health centers equipped with our solar suitcases. I mentioned our Light of Rebirth initiative earlier. In 2017, we launched this initiative calling upon governments, UN agencies, and local and international NGOs to uplift maternal and newborn care by making a commitment to ensure that every public health facility has medical lighting and continuous power for safe deliveries. This is the first time that energy access has been prioritized for all healthcare institutions at the national level. We formalized partnerships with ministries of health and ministries of energy in Liberia, Uganda, Sierra Leone, and Zimbabwe, who have made commitment to light a rebirth, and we're currently conducting research into additional countries to get them to sign on. So now I'm going to show you a quick demo of the suitcase um, by our executive director and co-founder, uh, Dr. Laura Stachel. Hi, I'm Dr. Laura Stachel. I'm executive director and co-founder of We Care Solar, a nonprofit that is dedicated to providing simple and rugged solar solutions to maternal and newborn health providers worldwide. Our innovation is called the We Care Solar Suitcase. The We Care Solar Suitcase is a compact, complete, and rugged solar electric kit designed specifically for maternal and newborn health providers. They include a solar panel. This is a small solar panel, but the solar suitcase actually includes panels that are 80 watts to 250 watts in size. They also include... I'm just going to pause to make sure everybody can hear that. Can everybody hear that? Okay, great. ...include a lithium ferrous phosphate battery, which is behind this panel, and a charge controller, which regulates the amount of electricity, both coming from the solar panel to the battery and going to all the other devices that are included in the solar suitcase. I mentioned that the solar suitcase is complete. It is a sustainable solution that was really designed to use the free and um, environmentally friendly power of the sun in order to supply electricity to health facilities wherever they may be. The solar suitcase includes four medical quality lights. These are lights that were designed to be able to be used during surgeries, such as cesarean sections, as well as during deliveries and other medical procedures. They're designed to last 70,000 hours. They're very rugged, and they have a color rendition of their light that makes them very suitable for surgeries. They don't distort the color of the tissue in patients. So as a surgeon, I can tell you they work very well and uh, they in many ways are superior to some of the lights that are available in a lot of the health facilities in which we work. In addition to these lights, we also have spotlights in the form of LED headlamps. These headlamps are used by health providers who are either needing to walk around the health facility at night, or maybe they can be used during procedures such as during an episiotomy repair or looking for vaginal bleeding um, after a delivery where you really need to direct a spotlight um, in a very precise location. These are charged just like a cell phone is charged right off the solar suitcase, so another sustainable part of our solution. In addition, these chargers can be used to charge many cell phones or other types of cell phone chargers can be put into either the USB port or the 12 volt DC port that's included. We also include a fetal heart rate monitor. This fetal Doppler is very helpful to midwives who are trying to detect whether a baby may be in distress. They both identify whether or not a baby is in having bradycardia, meaning the heart rate is too slow, or tachycardia, where the heart rate is too fast. And it has an audible sound, um, which both helps the midwife herself, but it also helps mothers and fathers 
who are also very interested in hearing their babies. And we find that a lot of people have told us that more patients come to the health facility for their prenatal exams when they know that they can actually hear the fetal heartbeat. In addition, during the COVID pandemic, we've now started including infrared thermometers. These are no touch thermometers that are used by midwives and other health providers at the door of the health facility to determine who may have an elevated temperature and to try and help triage patients so that we don't mix patients at risk for COVID with those who are very healthy. In addition, we include a AAA and AA battery charger and we include rechargeable batteries so that in these last mile health centers that are far from any stores that might have batteries or may not have a large budget, they can use the batteries that we include over and over, both for the fetal Doppler and also for the thermometer. Okay, um, that was all I had. I'm happy to answer any questions or um, I'll turn it back over to Kim or Suzanne, but thank you very much. Thanks, Kim, that was wonderful. Um, I'm wondering if there are any uh, initial questions for Kim. We're working across three screens. So um, putting your question in the chat helps me to see it or using the um, raised hand signal under reactions is also helpful. Um, so any questions for Kim? We're getting some positive reactions, a fine and well thought out project, well done. Uh, question, um, what is the cost of one case? Yeah, so the cost of uh, one solar suitcase, which includes all of the things that you saw is $2,265. Um, that's not including the installation and the training and all of the other things we do to ensure uh, sustainable programs. We generally say that, you know, all in, if you were to talk about all of those pieces, including shipping and clearance and, and training and installation, it's about $3,500 a clinic to provide, um, to provide reliable electricity for the facility. And that would be That's US. US dollars, sorry. Yeah. yeah. And Richard, maybe um, can you, um, from, the, from the PWRDF um, cost point of view, how are we costing them. I, yes, thank you. I, I think at the end of my presentation, Carolyn will be able to give you that breakdown. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. All right. Um, Deborah asks, which countries are you hoping to work in with the solar suitcase? Um, Kim? That's forward? a good question. Um, so we've, we've delivered, as I mentioned, we've delivered solar suitcases to over 40 countries. Um, but our Light of Rebirth initiative is really focusing on uh, investing in specific countries where the government is making a commitment to ensure that reliable lighting and electricity is available for all of their health facilities. And in those countries, we really go deep. We hire in country staff, we form agreements with the government. To date, we've done that in Liberia, Uganda, uh, Sierra Leone, and Zimbabwe. And we're currently looking at um, a few other countries, I think Malawi, the Gambia, um, and Nigeria in terms of expanding. And a lot of it really, it, there's a lot of factors involved. Um, a lot of it depends on obviously needs. So what's the maternal mortality rates in the country? What's the electrification rate in the country? Um, who do we know in the country? Have we worked with, have we worked there in the past? Have we had pleasant um, experiences with, is the government going to be supportive or are they gonna provide barriers? So there's a lot of things we look at when we look to go into a new country, as far as light of rebirth is concerned. And so our team is currently conducting research into those countries to kind of see what the feasibility is there. That's not to say we don't work in other countries. We obviously work in Mozambique um, and we currently have a program ongoing in Ethiopia. So in those instances, it's really a matter of a combination of local partners and funding. So if there's a uh, local partner who's interested and there's funding available, then we are certainly explore going outside of those kind of light of rebirth countries to do these programs in these other countries. And there was a related question as to whether you worked in Haiti. We have worked in Haiti. Uh, we worked in Haiti after the earthquake. We've been working in Haiti on and off since I want to say 2012. Um, I don't know off the top of my head how many solar suitcases we have currently in Haiti, but we've worked through several partners there 
And that's usually uh, based on, again, need and usually in response to a disaster. I don't think we've done kind of a, a standard program, but it's usually in response to a disaster. Somebody contacts us and says, we really need these the solar suitcases and, and we'll do our best to get it to them. Okay. Um, there's a question about um, how they're financed and can we help? And I think we'll, we'll circle back to that question when Carolyn speaks um, and specifically how PWRDF can, can assist with that. Um, and, but maybe, maybe Kim Gordon, you want to say a word about um, how the, your various projects in various countries are financed. Um, we have a pretty diverse source of funding. Most of our funding will come from foundations um, and some kind of large scale individual donors. We also have, you know, individual donations. We have an ongoing campaign right now called, um, now I'm forgetting what it's called, Sponsor Clinic, where individuals who want to make small scale donations can go online and, and just sponsor one clinic. Um, for that $3,500 price that I that I quoted earlier. Um, and then we have, you know, organizations like PWRDF and um, who have a specific interest in supporting a country and they can, they have a partner that they have in mind. So we'll, we'll support those programs as well. But those are kind of our primary sources of funding. Thank you. Thank you. There's some um, really positive comments here. Yukon Betty um, says, this is so amazing. I have a friend who had major problems birthing her baby in the Yukon, and she is really interested in this project. So, um, and Ken has um, just put in a link there to uh, the, the page, including a video about the solar suitcases uh, uh, on the PWRDF website. Um, technical question, how long does it take to charge? And in, especially in colder countries with less sun, yeah, that's a good question. And I think it really does depend. We found that, well, we in our older models, we found that during the rainy season, the battery wasn't charging up 100% throughout the day. And um, we have since kind of resolved that issue with a larger battery. So the, the new version three comes with a larger battery that's really designed to fully charge each day, even in rainy season or season periods where it's not as sunny. Um, we also expanded the, um, wattage of the solar panel to allow for um, better kind of sun intake and conversion to electricity. So it again, it depends on the season, but it's yeah. ideally designed to fully charge the battery on like throughout the, 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 the daylight hours. And on a one full charge, okay. I should also say on a full charge, the the lights can last on the low setting for 60 hours on one charge. And on if all four lights are on the high setting, it'll last throughout the night for 12 hours. That's great. Um, and another uh, sort of technical question uh, about the durability of the suitcases. How long can they be used in terms of years from the time of purchase? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, the suitcases are really designed with durability in mind. And we say that, you know, with one battery replacement at five years, they should last at least 10 years. That said, um, we've only been a nonprofit for 11 years. So um, we have gone back to look at solar suitcases that were installed at the very beginning and they're still functional. So I think it really depends on um, proper use but I think with proper use, it could be expanded to 15, even 20 years, as long as there's that battery replacement happening every five years. And we'll be hearing um, from Richard about um, the solar suitcase project that is now about five years in and mm -hmm. so could speak to that as well. Um, we Maybe just time for uh, one more question. Um, oh, this, this is a question to PWRDF. Um, does PWRDF mo mostly focus in Uganda? And this is, I am assuming, related to the solar suitcases. Um, but Richard, uh, maybe when we come to Richard, he could talk about um, the project that we partner with We Care Solar on, which is specifically in Mozambique. Um, uh, but, but We Care Solar, as we've learned, works in 40 countries. Uh, so um, are there any other questions before I um, introduce and pass over to Richard? 
thanks, Pete. Thanks to everyone who's putting questions in the chat. That's really helpful in terms of making sure we don't. I hope I haven't missed any. Um, okay, so um, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce Richard Leibrock, who um, many of you know, but uh, for those of you who don't, Richard has worked with PWRDF since 2014 as the external funding program manager. He is a certified educator in holistic management and one of the founders of the participatory ecological land use management network of more than 200 member organizations that promote sustainable agriculture in 12 countries of Eastern, Southern and Central Africa. And as we've heard, Richard has a long history of uh, engagement uh, and partnership with folk in Mozambique. So over to you, Richard. Well, thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, I'm honored to be part of this virtual platform with Kim from We Care Solar uh, to introduce uh, the other stakeholders of the Light for Every Birth project and the significant impact uh, 30 solar suitcases have had uh, in a similar project since their installation in 2016. And thank you, Kim, uh, for a spellbinding introduction to We Care Solar and the innovation of solar suitcases, which have no doubt saved thousands upon thousands of lives in the world. And I'd like to pick up uh, where you left off um, to introduce you to Brad on the left and Whitney on the right, the two We Care Solar uh, trainers that traveled to Mozambique in 2016 to train a select group of Mozambicans on how to install and take care of solar suitcases. Uh, in her normal day job in the United States, Whitney is a professional installer of solar panels. Brad, on the other hand, is a very able handyman who also specializes in checking the health of babies just as soon as they are born as a doctor in his day job in Oakland, California. Some of you might recall he was called off a roof off a clinic in Mozambique by Zaida during an installation of a solar suitcase to save a newborn's life in the delivery room. But uh, that's another drama, uh, which we can talk about another day. To make an interesting story shorter, the We Care Solar trainers delivered a comprehensive training on how to install and take care of solar suitcases in just two days in the classroom in July, 2016. More days, however, were spent learning hands-on, always starting in a safe learning environment, such as this installation of a solar panel on a mock-up on the ground in the photo on the left, to graduate to install a solar panel on the roof of a real health center under expert supervision. After six supervised installations, trainees were required to install the remaining 24 solar suitcases on their own, and to submit photographs of their work to the trainers for assessment and feedback. By the end of the training, trainees were also skilled to train medical providers, such as trained birth attendants and nurses, how to operate and maintenance solar suitcases in the photo on the right. Successful trainees were awarded with certificates at the end of training in the photo on the left. Let's flash back a bit now to provide a bit of background on another key stakeholder in the project, EHALI. EHALI was created and registered as a non-for-profit NGO in 2011, following the breakup of a forerunner organization known as Salama over govern governance issues. Salama emerged as one of the strongest partners of PWRDF after an evaluation carried in 2011 demonstrated excellent results of Salama's public health education program to reduce HIV AIDS and maternal and child mortality rates. PWRDF supported Salama in the past through a Canadian coalition of NGOs known as Cooperation Canada Mozambique. Salama staff members responsible for those positive results and not implicated in the government's issues, therefore split from Salama and created a HALI to implement subsequent PWRDF and Global Affairs Canada funded projects that included community 
Health and Food Security from 2012 to 2016, and the All Mothers and Children Count Project from 2016 to 2020. Ehali is therefore a long-standing historical partner of PWRDF. Kneeling in the middle of this photo is Ehali's executive director, Ms. Olinda Sebastian Magaya, who some of you will remember visited Canada in 2016. Ehali has been one of the most innovative of PWRDF partners. Some of you might recall that it was Ehali that piloted bicycle and motorcycle ambulances, expectant mother houses in the photo on the right, and the Ehale community radio station in the Calavera on the bottom, which has been a beacon to transmit messages and popular health on such health topics as maternal and child health, domestic violence, teen pregnancy, early child marriage, and gender equality. The photo on the top right is a youth community theater group. More recently, in the All Mothers and Children Count Project, Ehali pioneered the introduction of integrated maternal and child health dispensaries on the left and solar suitcases at 30 health centers on the right to provide lighting for the safe birth of newborns delivered at night. Ehali continues to implement a project by both PWRDF and Global Affairs Canada that responds to the COVID-19 pandemic and scheduled to end in 2022. In addition, Ehali is a key player in consortium with nine other local NGOs implementing a USAID funded project entitled Achieving Quality of Health Services for Women and Children. The project started in 2019 and will end in 2023. The project covers not only the AMCC project operational area, but the entire province. Ace Holly's target group has in short always been women of childbearing age, newborns and children under five years of age. The focus has over the years been mother and child health, preventive health and HIV AIDS. A Holly's work with communities in Nampula province continues to be highly regarded by provincial and district public health authorities and the Canadian High Commission in Maputo, Mozambique. Thanks to Ehali, other stakeholders in the project include district health, the district health authority and local traditional leadership. The district public health authority is vital since the 30 health centers with solar suitcases provide the medical providers and the resources needed for them to carry out the medical services they provide. The traditional leadership, on the other hand, is important to encourage beneficiaries to seek out health service at the clinics, and they sit on a committee of a health center to ensure assets such as a solar suitcase are being taken care of. Another stakeholder is the provincial health authority that supervises the work of the district health authorities. In addition, it was the provincial health authority that has proposed an exemption on customs duty for the importation of 52 solar suitcases for the Light for Every Birth project. In this photo of Alinda and myself, flanking the then acting provincial director, Ehali and PWRDF received an honorary diploma in February, 2020 to recognize the contribution both organizations made to reduce the maternal, newborn, and child mortality rates over the years. Last but not least, Global Affairs Canada has been a significant stakeholder to fund solar suitcases to Mozambique with a six to one match in the AMCC project. The woman in the red t-shirt of this photo is for example, none other than Miss Diane Jacovella, the then Deputy Minister of Global Affairs Canada that visited the AMC project in Mozambique in December, 2018. In terms of geography, Mozambique is the country in Africa in light green on the coast of the Indian Ocean, just opposite the island of Madagascar. The province of Nampula is number seven in the image of the provinces in Mozambique. The focus area for the 30 solar suitcases was on the coast 
over the 2016-2020 period in the All Mothers and Children Count project. The intention of the, the new project this year is to cover the rest of the province most in need of the 52 solar suitcases. In terms of impacts of the solar suitcase, we have learned that it, it enables trained birth attendants to assist pregnant women safely at a clinic at night. It reduces the risk of cross infection between patient and birth attendant. It provides timely assistance for obstetric emergencies. It facilitates quicker referrals. It increases the number of institutional births, particularly at night. It encourages more use of maternal, newborn and child health services, which I will come back to. Lastly, it contributes to the reduction of maternal and neonatal mortality and morbidity rates. In terms of positive birth experiences since 2016, more than 80,000 women delivered in the 30 health facilities with solar suitcases of the AMC project over the 2016-2020 period. Health facilities in Memba, Mogavolas, Monapo, and Arati districts reported twice as many night deliveries after the solar suitcases were installed. Incredibly, health facilities in Leupo, Mekonta, Nakaroa, Nakavela, and Mosoril districts reported approximately 17.5 times more night deliveries after the solar suitcases were installed, which is wildly beyond our wildest dreams. We have learned that the solar suitcase is a technical innovation or intervention that unlocks many other doors to address the well being of women, newborns, and children for a lifetime. A positive experience and safe delivery at a health facility with a solar suitcase particularly at night, incentivizes pregnant women to enter and remain within a holistic continuum of care that includes that first and important postnatal checkup after the birth of the baby at a health center. Look deep into those eyes and the smile of the face. If that's not a satisfied client, I don't know what is. Also at the clinic, the consumption of colostrum by the newborn baby shortly after birth and the initiation and coaching on exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of the infant's life. Eventually, there's a transition back to the village. The photo in front of you is a group of safe motherhood promoters. The safe motherhood promoter is assigned to pregnant women in the village and she is there to provide or refer pregnant women for any health related need. A safe motherhood promoter is trained to accompany pregnant women and families throughout the pregnancy. She is also on the lookout for signs of domestic violence at home and malnutrition of children. She is also the main fount of knowledge in the village on hygiene and sanitation, which is important to mitigate waterborne diseases such as cholera and malaria. Learning to make nutritious foods with local products in the photos on the right and to feed solids to babies in the photo on the left is also a key uh, thing. Here we see the making of a rich porridge in the photo on the right. Very important for the nutrition of the growing child. Also important is that regular attendance at subsequent postnatal checkups for growth and development monitoring. And this is key in returning to the health center. Second, vaccinations to prevent against diseases such as diphtheria, whooping cough, tetanus, measles, polio, rubella, hepatitis B, pneumonia, and rotavirus that commonly attack newborns and under fives. Seeking out the diagnosis of sickness at pediatric triage can all, of course also make all the difference in the world between life and death in Mozambique. Malaria, for example, is still the number one killer of children under five years of age. Private consultation rooms have proved to be essential 
for private matters like sexual and reproductive health in which testing is done for such sexually transmitted diseases as HIV AIDS, private consultation between medical provider and patient and family is important to encourage health seeking behavior in village environments in which everyone knows everybody. If parents have positive experience during the birth of a child at a health center with a solar suitcase, she and her spouse are more likely to seek out prenatal consultations for the next pregnancy. Technically, the father of the baby must attend the first prenatal consultation in Mozambique to have his awareness raised on the nutritional needs of his pregnant partner. It is a crucial time to get the father involved in the whole pregnancy and birthing experience. It creates the space to discuss about sexually transmitted diseases, how these diseases are transmitted and the importance of periodic HIV testing for the couple. Such conversations are important because they put less pressure on women having to explain to their partners if they are HIV positive, which has often led to domestic violence. Prenatal visits also include HIV testing every three months to prevent vertical transmission to the fetus. If positive for HIV, the pregnant woman can receive Neprovin eight weeks before delivery. During prenatal care, women are also monitored for anemia, gestational diabetes, and high blood pressure. They also receive vaccinations for tetanus, rubella, and ongoing monitoring of the baby's in utero development. Last, but certainly not least, women have access to family planning. This is very important because it empowers women to take control of their sexual and reproductive health and to make decisions on when they wish to get pregnant, what type of contraceptive they prefer, and to understand other aspects of their own health, such as sexually transmitted diseases and the risk of breast and cervical cancer. In summary, this is part and parcel of a holistic continuum of healthcare that can unfold for a lifetime should pregnant women have positive experiences and safe deliveries of babies by a trained birth attendant at a health center equipped with a solar suitcase. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. That was wonderful. Uh, before we go to questions for Richard or Kim or Faiza, um, I just want to um, ask Carolyn, our colleague Carolyn Cummins, to uh, say a word about PWRDF support for the Solar Suitcase Project and how you can become involved. Carolyn, can you give us a word? I can. Thank you, Suzanne. And I'm very happy to say that PWRDF is, is really grateful and really fortunate to have a generous donor who wants to help us make sure that we can meet our goal of equipping all of these clinics with, uh, with solar suitcases. And so this donor has offered to give us up to $100,000 in matching funding. Uh, so all donations made up to September 30th towards our Light for Every Birth project will be matched one-to-one. Uh, -one. So this is um, amazing news for us and is really gonna help push us towards, uh, towards meeting that goal. And amazing news for our donors uh, who want to see a big impact with their with their gifts. So between now and September 30th, every gift uh, made will be matched uh, with thanks to our wonderful donor for making that possible. So ways to help, obviously, uh, one is to, to give and support the project with Ihali and Care Solar. Uh, you can also help us to spread the word about this project and about the matching funding. Um, it's not always easy in the Anglican Church of Canada to get the word out across the country to, uh, to where we would like to. So uh, if you can help share this news, we will make the recording of this uh, available to you if you'd like to share it. And there are other resources on our website about the project that you can help us to share out. If you know of any foundations or service clubs like Rotary Clubs, uh, corporations that might be interested 
in funding something like this, please uh, just let us know. We're not asking you to uh, to uh, make a you know make an ask for us, but if you could make an introduction for us, that would be amazing. Um, and we can see if we if we have some similar goals with some foundations or other organizations out there who might like to partner with us in this uh, in this amazing project. Um, and we do have some of you know about the Ride for Refuge. Some of you have participated in the Ride for Refuge in past years, and this year the Ride will be uh, raising funds for this project. So if you'd like to participate, it's um, it used to be just a, a bike ride, but because of COVID, it's expanded to allow you to do basically whatever you would like to do to fundraise. So we've had people uh, riding bikes, but we've also had people running and walking and reading and knitting and doing all sorts of things to, uh, to raise funds. So if you'd like to participate with us in that, um, please be in touch with me or with, uh, with Kim. Uh, just on the question of budget that came up earlier. So the cost for PWRDF to, to equip one clinic with a solar suitcase is $5,800. That's Canadian dollars, not US dollars. And that includes um, all of the costs that we heard about earlier in terms of acquiring the suitcases um, and the training. It also includes insurance, it includes getting them there, so the shipping. It includes our cost to make sure that we're properly monitoring uh, the project. And uh, it also, I don't think it was mentioned earlier that we are also updating those batteries in the, the suitcases that were installed in 2016. So we'll be shipping new batteries because we are at the five year mark now uh, to make sure that those um, initial suitcases continue to function well. Um, so I think that's all I need to say, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Carolyn. I, I noticed as you were speaking, a question came up about who should we send donations to? And uh, Janice responded to explain that you can do that online um, by going to pwrdf.org slash give hyphen today and click on light for every birth. But I'm just wondering, I think Mike... Uh, Zimmerink is with us and Mike if you could you just wave and say hello because if people wanted to donate to a live human being um, you would be it. I, I am that live human being that is correct. Um, so yeah there, there's lots of ways you can donate. Um, Janice put the uh, link in the chat so you can do that online uh, but if you prefer to send a check that is also okay. Um, you can send that to our head office still. We're still collecting checks that way. Just make sure you note that the uh, check is for the solar suitcase or light for every birth project. Um, or you can also call me. Uh, my phone number is on that uh, webpage that Janice shared as well. Um, there's a cell phone number there, so you can reach me there and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions over the phone at a later date, or, or I can take a MasterCard or Visa donations over the phone as well. Thanks, Mike. Um, Going back to uh, questions, um, a question for Richard. Uh, could you speak to how the solar suitcases are maintained? That might be a question for you or a question for Kim Gordon. Yeah, I'll, I'll defer to Kim on that one. Okay. So I can't, uh, well, I was going to defer to Richard in terms of how they're maintained in the Mozambique context, but I can speak more generally. Um, as I mentioned, the solar suitcases are designed to really require minimal maintenance aside from that battery replacement at five years. Now we do encourage, it really depends again on the specifics of the program. A lot of times they'll be installed in government health facilities. So one thing we do is encourage um, installers to include government technicians either in, as part of the installation process or in some cases will actually provide maintenance training specifically for government technicians so that when they're visiting these health facilities on their regular regu regularly scheduled visits um, they can check on the health of the solar suitcase and provide any basic troubleshooting as needed there's also a troubleshooting guide in the user manual that we are hope will assist the health workers in terms of really basic things. So they, sometimes they'll accidentally turn the power switch off and think that that's just turning the lights off. So things like that are covered as part of that guide to make sure that it's used properly and, and um, those kind of basic things aren't preventing them from being able to use the equipment. 
Um, we also, in some countries, will send people out to do regular follow-up visits or we'll conduct follow-up phone calls to check on the health of the system. Um, and then we also have an incident report available on our website where people can go and fill out a report if they're having a problem and reach one of our technicians to specifically provide input and try to help troubleshoot. So there's a number of ways in which we make sure the solar suitcases are working and it really depends on the specifics of who's responsible for the program, is it government health facility? So again, maybe Richard can speak more in the context of Mozambique, but um, those are kind of the ways in which we approach maintenance. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely agree. Uh, in the Mozambique context, uh, that was one reason for, in terms of design, the people trained, uh, there were about a dozen individuals and uh, I, I, I did, more than half were from the electrical maintenance of the Ministry of Health. And that's what they do, everything electrical, they go around checking things, but also uh, four, four to five in individuals from uh, a Hali were also trained because we wanted to get the best of both worlds. We wanted it from the official government, but sometimes government doesn't is not always that effective and efficient. So we also brought in the civil society with a Hali uh, because they circulate a lot uh, amongst the clinics. So try to hedge your bets and get the best of both worlds and they all have that uh, um, the, the curriculum, which uh, you know PWRDF had translated into Portuguese. So they have that uh, whole chapter on maintenance and, and keeping things in good order. Um, at my level, really, the only thing they look to me at for is the all important replacement of the battery every five years. Generally speaking with uh, solar power, if you get it set up right and you train local people, there's very little maintenance. It's one of the beauties of solar power. And uh, so there's not really a lot of uh, uh, maintenance costs. Um, and the other reason why one thing we learned, uh, we're giving one solar suitcase to a Holly uh, with this second project so that they can remotely assist uh, clinics uh, when they call in, if there's a, a, a small repair needed or even maintenance advice, they can just use WhatsApp and uh, by showing, you know, the, pointing the camera towards the We Care Solar uh, suitcase they have in their own office, they can help take care of a lot of maintenance and uh, minor repair issues. Thank you. And I should add to that, we do send spare parts with our equipment. So um, they will have, um, they're actually, getting an extra a complete extra solar suitcase that's you know has all of the spare parts you might need plus some additional parts so that you know things that we know sometimes might go wrong like maybe a light cord gets frayed because it's in a door or something like that we do make sure that there is some um, parts available in the country to replace those as needed yeah Thanks. i should mention as well uh suzanne that uh Locally, increasingly, there, there's not the lithium batteries present, but there is another type of battery the same time, which will also charge with solar power uh, that is increasingly available in, in African countries. Uh, we haven't really seen them in Nampula yet, but uh, they're becoming increasingly common. Uh, you know, there are a lot of materials that can make batteries. It's not just lithium. Um, there's so many other possibilities. So we do have a local option if we need it, but we are just taking advantage of the fact we're doing a major shipment of, you know, 52 more solar suitcases. Why not just add on all these uh, 30 uh, spare lithium batteries as well and, and do it all at the same time. Give them, you know, a problem-free 10-year period to collect data on what difference uh, these solar suitcases are making. Right. And am I right in remembering, Richard, that the, the 30 um, suitcases that were installed five years ago are still all operational? Is that correct? Yes, yeah. yeah, so we, we could check with Linda, but the last report I had, uh, they were all operating, but she, she's out there somewhere and she could also uh, let us know that. If there's any, I'm not aware of any that are not functioning. That's great. Uh, I'm aware that we've come to two o'clock. We had um, the, the time time for this webinar was originally 90 minutes, then 60. And so um, if people will bear with us, there are a few more questions, but if you do need to leave, that's, that's okay too. And you will be receiving a recording of, um, 
of the full webinar. But there are a number of questions in the chat um, that I'd like to see if we can get to. Question from Haley, um, asking for a clarification. I think of you, Richard. Um, there is a just to clarify, there's a direct connection between clinics with the solar suitcases resulting in the extra services being utilized. So what's the connection between solar presence of solar suitcases and some of these other services that you were talking about being available? Yeah. Well, yeah, there definitely is a direct uh, connection between the presence of the solar suitcases and the increase in nighttime deliveries. That, that's for certain. Uh, but I, I wouldn't go as far as to say uh, there's direct connection because really the solar suitcase is there at a very sort of pivotal time. I mean, uh, the, the birth of a child is a time of hope and great expectations, but also uncertainty. It's also the most vulnerable point in a woman's life often. So it's quite a dramatic moment. And if you can provide a safe delivery, a positive experience, that's much more likely to incentivize the couple to get into that whole continuum of other services available, which we mentioned. And so that's why we're, we're not outrightly saying, uh, at least I'm not saying that for sure, the presence of solar suitcases have reduced child mortality by such a percent because there are many interventions happening and the whole idea is to make them supporting each other to sort of get that tipping point when we see the mortality rates fall. But I cannot attribute uh, you know, a certain percentage to a particular intervention. All I can say is the solar suitcase has been pivotal and that's why in this second phase, we are investing all in on this one intervention and we're no longer supporting all the other interventions that's ongoing with the district public health authorities. But we believe uh, so much from just listening to our partners, well, Linda can better describe than me of the huge difference we make that we are convinced let's go all in and invest in 52 more in the second round. So stay tuned for part two from Melinda about, about all of that. Thank you, Richard. Um, there's a series of questions uh, that might best be answered by Carolyn uh, or Mike. Um, uh, can we donate to our local church through our PWRDF donations with a memo to solar suitcases? Uh, can the Ride for Refuge donations be matched by our friendly anonymous donor? Uh, and there was another one. Oh, that's right. Is our government involved in providing funding with this program? So um, could one of you speak to that set of questions around the funding? Sure, I could start. Uh, Mike, you can correct me when I get it wrong. Uh, so absolutely, you can donate through your church if that's how you would like to give and just make sure that it's uh, marked for a light for every birth project or solar suitcase project uh do it'd be worth inquiring with your church though how frequently they remit funds to pwrdf because um some some parishes uh, and some dioceses are only remitting at the end of the year uh and if that's the case it, you might want to consider giving directly to pwrdf uh to make sure that your donation is matched because we do have that September 30th uh, deadline um, and as well just to get the funds to us in time for this project. So um, that would be worth checking, but generally, yes, you can always give to PWRDF through your parish. Um, sorry, Suzanne, what was the second question? Uh, and now, oh, Ride for Refuge and whether the funds right. raised could be matched. Yeah, by our so, donor. yeah, we'll look into that. And I think we just, we kind of want to keep tabs on how we're doing um with the fundraising and uh we'll see the ride for refuge official date is october i think it's october 2nd which is just outside of of our uh of our deadline but uh we will look at that and so because we certainly want to make sure that we achieve the uh the full hundred thousand dollar match and, and the government involved right. so um in this Case, this project is not funded by the government of Canada as it was previously. 
so it was previously through the All Mothers and Children Count program, which had a six to one match. Um, and that is one reason why the solar suitcases are much more costly to PWRDF this time, because we don't have those matching funds. And so we're contributing the full amount to, uh, to cover the cost of the solar suitcases. And you know because of what we learned from the last installation and just how valuable and how important these suitcases are, we decided that it was important for us to do this alone, even though this time it's not part of a government program. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, just a shout out to uh, Yukon Belly, Betty, who is diligently crocheting as we speak, <laughs> which she was doing uh, last year for the Ride for Refuge. And uh, Liz McDonald, who uh, noted in the chat that uh, this is inspiring her for her participation in the Ride for Refuge Team Vancouver. So um, talk, talk to Liz and Betty about doing the Ride for Refuge. You can do it all sorts of ways um, this year again. Uh, just a couple of last questions and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Roslyn asks, will there be a list of what's included in the $5,800 for those of us with short memories? Can someone answer that one? Yeah, I believe. It's already on the website. It's on the Stolar Suitcases page. Oh, great. Okay. That's great. And um, my apologies if I'm missing any questions here. There's lots of um, very positive uh, messages in the chat for those who would like to read them. Oh, um, Mary Donato asks a good question. The cost of replacing the battery every five years, do we know what that is? Richard I don't Kim have Gordon? that at hand, so I'll leave that to Richard or Kim if they maybe have that. Yeah, no, uh, I, I seem to recall Kim, uh, for 30 new uh, L, uh, LFP batteries, lithium batteries for the version two, uh, it was around $5,000 for 30. Was, was that about right? I don't remember. What, the what's the unit cost? What's the unit cost? Can you just refresh? Me um, I want to say, I don't know off the top of my head, I think it's 200 and something. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's obviously the cost of transport and manpower to go conduct the replacements. We generally uh, estimated about $500 per facility, which includes the product and the um, and the replacement. But again, it really varies by country, how rural the um, facilities are, and um, a lot of other factors that can go into play there. Thanks. Um, I think I noticed a hand up. Um, was it Abdul Masood? Did you have your hand up and ha had a question? I'm sorry I missed you earlier. Do you want to ask your question, Abdul? Maybe not. Okay. Oh, but Roz has her hand up. So <laughs> you can unmute. There you go. Okay. Just in case you miss it. Um... I'm in a, a quite a small church, and I don't think we would be able to raise 5,800 or whatever it is, but they might like to feel that they were raising enough for one suitcase. So if they raised half and the donor, that would work? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Ross. Yep, okay. definitely. Great. You Can know, say, there's other ways to do it. You could check with your lo other local churches and see if they'd like to participate or deanery, but oh, yeah. but absolutely what you're saying, if you raise half of that $5,800 and get it in by September 30th, it'll be matched. And hi to Zida. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her somewhere. Yeah, she was here. I don't know if she's still here. For, for those those few of you who don't know Zida, she is our recently retired and much- Hi, Rosalind. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> development <laughs> director. <laughs> Good to see you, Zaida. Um, I think, I, I hope I haven't missed a question. Has, is, does anyone have a last question before we wrap up? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Oh, you hold your peace or email us later. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to unmute and ask if you'd like at this point. All right. Well, I think then, oh, Kaslita uh, um, has uh, put his hand up. Would you like to ask a question? 
Uh, yes, uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for this great presentation. I'm really so happy to, 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 to join. And there is a lot I have really learned. Uh, my inquiry is, okay, like uh, when, uh, when that solar case is used, uh, about like for how long, for example, if I put in the, uh, like uh, to get this, the, the solar, to get the, sun, the, the sunshine, for how long can it last after having been charged? Thank you very much. Thanks, Kasita. Could you answer that, Kim? Yeah, of course. Um, so as I, I mentioned earlier, the, the new version three solar suitcase, the one that we're installing 50 of in Mozambique, um, will last for the, if the, it depends on how, on what all is being used at any given time. But if there are, all four lights are on at the same time on the highest power, it'll last for 12 hours. So at a minimum, it'll last for the night on a full charge. If all four lights are on at the low setting, it can last up to 60 hours. Now, obviously it all, there's also phone charging and battery charging and all these other things, which we really, as part of our health worker training, we really encourage them to only use during the day so that they get the maximum benefit of the lights at night. So that's, that's kind of a summary. Again, it depends on what all is using power at any given time. I should mention as well, in Mozambique with the hot sun, it only takes a few hours in the morning only to fully charge the version two battery. That's great. I think we're going to wrap up here. Just um, appreciate your comments in the chat, the very positive ones. Um, Chris Farrow, uh, I, would, I look forward to sharing the recording far and wide in the Diocese of Nova Scotia and PEI. So, and Doreen Davidson, our parish just donated $300 towards the suitcases, more hopefully in the future. So. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your time and support. Kim, I'm back. Would you <laughs> like to would you like to say some thank yous and wrap us up? Yeah, so just um, want to thank uh, Kim Gordon and uh, Fisa from uh, We Care Solar and uh, for my colleagues Richard, Janice, Carolyn and Suzanne for helping to pull this together and uh, and of course to all of you for for coming and uh, for sharing it far and wide within your diocese. So I will be making the recording available and uh, uh, encourage you to um, keep your eyes open for our next um, webinar, which will be on our uh, work with Canadian Food Grains Bank. So uh, we'll be back out in touch and thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, thank you.